a new prodigy has emerged in the world of Muay Thai. Folks, welcome to Kick Weekly with Tim Wheaton, the weekly kickboxing podcast covering all the latest news and fights in the world of kickboxing and Muay Thai. This week, we're going to be talking about Nautica Yoshinari and just picking up his fourth stadium Muay Thai title, his third in Raja Damnern. We're also going to be talking about some of the news on K1 Max and the recent updates to the tournament. Plus, uh, we have some updates on the Glory Grand Prix and some speculation around that. And we'll also cover off some One Fight Night 19 and some other news that we have going on. Folks, I appreciate you joining me, but let's jump into the news that everyone wants to talk about. Nadaka Yoshinari. He is a Japanese phenom in the world of Muay Thai. One of the reasons that he is a big deal is that Muay Thai largely takes place in the lower weight divisions anywhere from from 105 pounds up to 135 pounds is the really competitive range that people who are into Muay Thai gambling really focus on. The bigger weight classes like 145 and up is usually just considered for foreigners. So most of the uh, so most Thai fights in history, the really important weight classes are about 105 to 135, uh, and then it's kind of foreigners and up. So the reason Nautica Yoshinari is important is, is for a few different reasons, but he competes in that lower range where it's typically dominated by Thai-born fighters. At the current moment, so that's kind of the historic perspective, but at the current moment, those weight classes, a lot of them are not overly competitive, but he's been dominating in those weight classes, and what sets him apart The reason that he's highly ranked in pound for pound and highly respected, even though those aren't the most competitive weight classes that he's been dominating, he's been beating everyone in those weight classes and looked really good doing it. So he started at 105 pounds and has been picking up titles and working his way up slowly picking up more titles, up to 115 pounds. So the most recent one was at 115 ones, and he just beat Prow Prow this past weekend. He is now on a 29-fight win streak. He is unbeaten in 29 fights. And what we talk about is he looked really impressive in those fights, is that 24 of those wins were by way of knockout. And keep in mind, you know, how small this weight division is, and he's just been knocking everybody out in those weight classes. He's a highly, highly skilled fighter. So he picked up a title in Lumpini Stadium, he picked up two in Raja Domner, and just this past weekend, he picked up his third in Raja Domner when he beat Prow Prow over five rounds. Prow Prow was by far the biggest test and challenge of his career. That was the biggest name that he had ever faced, and for the biggest title and the biggest weight class that he's ever seen. So we're going to be talking about what's next for him, but let me get through the story. In the past, he's already picked up titles in WMC, IBF, BOM, PAT, WBC, and of course the stadium titles. Really impressive for a 23-year-old. He's also earned knockouts with every limb, from his knees, from his elbows, in the clinch, at distance, kicks, punches, low kicks, high kicks, whatever it is, he has earned knockouts by doing that. So from all that, he's a highly skilled fighter, and in most of his fights, he goes unchallenged, and for that, it's an extremely impressive thing. He's not competing in these weight classes and struggling. He's competing in these weight classes and blasting people out there. Even the Prow Prow one, even the Prow Prow win that we just had this past weekend was supposed to be his biggest challenge, and that was the most he's ever struggled in a match, and it wasn't all that close. He scored a knockdown in the first round and then dominated the rest of the rounds. He's an aggressive fighter. He has a very active defense, and we're going to be talking about defense a lot in this episode, but defense kind of goes in in layers. So the first layer is moving your feet. This is followed by parrying. Then it's moving your head, and the last line of defense is blocking. And then countering kind of gets mixed in because it's on every single layer that you can do a counter. So you move your feet, then counter. Parry, then counter. Move your head, then counter. And then block and counter. So counter gets mixed in on every layer of defense. But his specialty is right on the first layer. He moves his feet. He angles off and chooses what exchanges he wants to participate in. So he forces his opponents to participate in the exchanges where they are at a disadvantage. He's not fighting on his opponent's terms. When his opponents want to engage, he's not there. And when he wants to engage, his opponents are not ready because he angled off, he backed out, he picked his shots. Even though it is a small weight class, he typically has a speed and power advantage on these people. He is a really aggressive and skilled striker who's very fast, but honestly, his his strength, I think, is defense. The, the footwork, picking his exchanges, angling off, it, it's really, really high quality high level stuff that he's doing in there. So I'm really impressed with him. But now that he's beaten everybody in these weight divisions, all the important titles he's picked up in these weight divisions, RWS is looking to have him move up. Him moving up is going to be the biggest challenge of his career. 
So we beat Prow Prow this past week, and Prow Prow is notoriously uh, hard-headed and tough. Uh, he's also a very hard hitter. He he loves to bang. He loves to brawl. And we know that he's tough because he gets dropped in almost every fight. Um, so he didn't he doesn't really do defense very much. He doesn't block. He doesn't move his head. He doesn't do any of the stuff like that. He just takes the punches on his head. Most of the time he survives. Sometimes he gets dropped. Sometimes he gets knocked out. Uh, but typically, even when he gets dropped, he will he will rally back. Uh, so while it was the most challenging fight of Nautica Yoshinari's career, I feel like as an opponent, Prow Prow ended up playing very well into Nautica's game because he just kept coming forward. But regardless, it was a great win against a very experienced and skilled opponent. So now that he's cleared out these weight divisions and did it in impressive fashion, RWS wants him to move up to 117 pounds. And at 117 pounds, things really move up. Not only would this be the, the largest weight division that Nautica has ever competed in, but it comes with very, very big challenges ahead of him. RWS has juggled the names Kumandoi and Kunsaklek, both of which are highly ranked pound for pound Muay Thai strikers already. In fact, Kumandoi is, is pound for pound ranked both in kickboxing and Muay Thai, so he has earned the highest acclaim that you can in two different sports. He has competed at the highest levels in two different sports. He's picked up titles in True For You, WBC, Omnoy Stadium, and two divisions in Raja Damnern Stadium. However, he was recently hospitalized due to a motorbike accident, so whether he's going to make a comeback anytime soon or what kind of shape he's in after that accident, it's it's really tough to say, but Kunsek Lek is also also there, and he is a top pound for pound Muay Thai striker who has picked up titles in PAT Omnoy Stadium, and he is unbeaten in his last 39 matches going back to 2019. He's on an incredible run, highly ranked, highly skilled, highly dangerous. So Kumandoi or Kunseklek are both incredible, incredible fights for uh, Nautica Yoshinari next, and it would be a, a massive statement if he can beat either of those guys like right now I, I am of course like as you've seen from the video I did last week uh breaking down Nautica Yoshinari I'm obviously a fan of Nautica I'm not sure that he beats either Kumandoi or Kunsek like in all honesty those are massive challenges those are massive undertakings and it's going to be a really tough fight either way no matter who it's against but yes, massive congratulations to Nautica Yoshinari. Winning four titles in Stadium Muay Thai is a massive, massive, it's a massive big deal. Extending his win streak to 29 wins, uh, picking up, uh, you know, defeating the biggest challenge of his career. And RWS put on a good show last week. It was a, it was a fun one there in Corican Hall. So looking forward to more. Whatever his next fight is, we'll certainly be covering it. And uh, yeah, that's great. Let's move on to K1 Max, which is coming up later this year. So we know that it's going to be a 16-man tournament at 70 kilograms or 155 pounds. Of the 16 fighters in it, 12 have now been revealed. And let's break it down. So there's four mysteries, and I'll talk about those as well. Participating in this tournament will be Wu Young Feng, who is the champion in WLF and K1. Hiromi Wajima, the former champion in K1. Daryl Verdonk, the champion from Infusion. David Kiria, the former champion in Glory and competitor in one championship. Stoyan Koplavinsky, the former top contender in both Rise and Glory. Jordan Pickier, the former K1 contender and champion in Crush. You also have Pascal Schroth, Denuge Silva, Teras Hanchuk, Zora Akepian, Umar Samata, Vasily Semenov. So I knew the first few guys, but I will find out more about the other gentlemen before the event and get back to you just on like what styles, what titles these gentlemen have picked up. But the six names that I know, it's a very good tournament with just those six names. And then you have the other gentlemen from all around the world, probably a lot of Iska and Waco European champions there, uh, regional champions from where they come from. So it's going to be a really good event. So those are the top 12 fighters who have now been revealed. And then there are four fighters who have not been revealed as of yet. I think we are expecting it to be Misaki Nori, the former K1 champion, Keito Ono, the champion in shoot boxing. And I'm, I'm almost certain that while this hasn't been speculated in a bunch, I think it's actually going to be Petch Morikot because I know Petch Morikot's manager was really trying to get in on that. So in this, in this, you, you have quite a few like former current K1 champions, shoot boxing champions, former contenders in glory or rise and current champions from WLF. Like it's a very global, all organizations kind of represented and a ton of different countries represented as well, which I'm so happy about. Like obviously we, we knew Europe, Central Asia 
and Asia was going to be represented. And we see that with countries like Japan, China, Germany, uh, Georgia, Russia, and others like that. But I'm happy to see it's even more global than that. So you also have people representing Brazil. So we have South America in the tournament. And that's great to see. You also have Umar Samata, who is from Uganda originally. So you have Africa represented in the tournament as well. So I like that it's a global tournament. And that's a ton of fun. That stuff is really great. Because if it was just a bunch of people from two countries, Japan and the Netherlands, it's a little bit harder to make the argument that this is a world thing. But they did get people from all over the globe. And I'm really excited for that. That's going to be absolutely awesome. But I think the biggest note coming out from this is the nicknames that they gave to each person. And I think these were just assigned by K1 or something, but these are these are some nicknames right here. So you have Passionate Waji Max. What? Passionate Waji Max? I don't know what that means. New Emperor of Asia? Great nickname. That is very fitting for Ooh Young Fang. Beautiful Werewolf. That's a great name for Daryl Verdonk. Beautiful Werewolf. That could be my name. <laughs> Bremen Assassination Squad for Pascal from Germany. Bremen Assassination Squad. It's so cool. That's a good one. Um, Scorching Big Mosquito. What? Scorching Big Mosquito for Dan, uh, from for the Brazilian fighter Silva. Scorching Big Mosquito. What? Wandering Iron Man for David Kyria is is actually quite nice. That's a that's a nice one there because he's kind of gone from glory to one. He's wandered around. He's fought in different organizations. Wandering Iron Man is kind of a cool one. Hope of Ukraine for Taras Nachek, who's, who's from the Ukraine. Really good name. That's fire. Unsinkable Ship for Stoyan Koprovinsky. Great nickname for Stoyan Koprovinsky. Unsinkable Ship. You also have New Demon Prince for Vasily Semenov. New Demon Prince. Cool name. Gem of Uganda for Umar. Great name. You also have... But then it gets just... There's a twist suddenly, right? So some of the names are really good, like like New Emperor of Asia or Unsinkable Ship or, or whatever. And some of them are just twisty like you like you have a beautiful werewolf and passionate waji max and then the last two are, are are in that vein mysterious bird of curacao for jordan Pickier. mysterious bird of curacao okay what a name and lastly for zora you have charming prince of seduction charming prince of seduction Imagine in this tournament, you get beautiful werewolf versus the charming prince of seduction. It sounds like a romance novel coming in here. The mysterious bird of Curacao taking on the new demon prince. Mm. It's very poetic sounding. Some of them came off as a bit sillier than they were expecting. I don't know. Like, I, I can understand where they got like Gem of Uganda from or New Emperor of Asia or something like that or Bremen Assassination Squad. I can understand where the base was and how they got to that but I don't know where they got Charming Prince of Seduction from or how they got to that point. Is that a mistranslation? Is that supposed to be something else? Because it can't be anything but the, the, the Charming Prince of Seduction. <laughs> so it's great. So it's great. Yeah, that's great. I'm really excited for the K1 Max. And you can see that the posters, of course, are back. Now, the K1 Max back in 2005, 2006 did use a lot of crosses and things like this in their in their iconography and in, in the new posters you see it you see the wolves the crosses stuff like that and back when k1 max was doing that the crosses weren't that insane considering like look at what people were wearing for affliction and tap out clothing so having crosses or chains or smoke or wolves wasn't that big of a leap because that's what people were kind of wearing in combat sports at the time at this point because that was almost 20 years ago at this point it's kind of a throwback so it looks very affliction-esque, and that's what we used to wear 20 years ago. So it, on one hand, some of the angelic looks and stuff like that does look a little bit corny. It does look a little bit try-hard, but it's kind maybe it's kind of a throwback to mid-2000s looks that people were doing in combat sports. And not only that, I think it's very important for, for combat companies to have a very distinct look. And I, I like that about a lot of companies is that if I showed you a clip for one second, you could identify whether it's Rise, K1, or Glory. They all look super different from each other, right? And K1 Max is the same thing. I could show you something for one second. You know it's K1 Max because they put a bunch of crosses on their stuff. So it's very important to have a, 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 a distinctive visual identity that's separate from one another. And K1 Max is certainly going for that. They're going for it. Whether or not they're accomplishing it as something that is very cool 
that's up to you. You let me know whether you like the iconography of their crosses and angels and wolves and stuff like that. We are we are in a nostalgia period where fashion is is cyclical and people are going back to late 90s, early 2000s fashion. So maybe the posters are a little bit of a throwback to that same period. I don't know. Maybe I'm just reading too much into it. Maybe it's just a bunch of angels and, and crosses and wolves just because, you know, <laughs> Okay, let's take a quick break on that one. When we come back, I'm going to be doing one championship and some news from the Glory Grand Prix and some other stuff. Thank you for listening to the Calf Kick Sports Network. Make sure to check out more interviews, highlights, and podcasts on the interview channels. Additionally, make sure to check out Calf Kick Sports on Instagram. Links for all of these will be down below. Now, back to the show. Thanks, folks, for sticking with me. Appreciate that. So Nordin Mehedin has dropped out of the Glory Heavyweight Grand Prix. He was originally scheduled to face his teammate, Nabil Kachab, but now he has been forcibly withdrawn from the tournament. The exact quote is due to an inability to comply with Glory's new safety and health regulation. So it sounds like he, even though they're not saying it, the new safety and health regulation that was implemented in at the start of 2024, that I think most likely sounds like that he tested positive for some sort of banned substance, whether that's a performance enhancing drug or something else that's on the banned substance list. But as much as they're saying he did something that went against glory, safety and health regulation. So he has been withdrawn from this tournament. And that means there's an open slot on this tournament. And now naturally people are speculating and naturally people begin to speculate on some major names in this tournament. So at this point, there is seven fighters in the tournament and it represents like one through eight on the official top 10 list. So it's quite a good tournament already. Having Rico in there is awesome. Just brings so much weight and seriousness to the tournament. So let's get to the speculation and then what I actually think will be happening and who will be filling in for the eighth man for the tournament. Some people have speculated Antonio Plazabot will be the late fill-in. He's injured. There's just no way for him to fill in. He did not recover his, his wrist from his last fight. But of course, the largest speculation goes to Jamal Ben Sadiq. He's been out since his awesome, exciting clash against Rico Verhoeven a couple of years ago because he was clashing with he, he was fighting with uh, the glory. Him and his manager were fighting with the glory CEO. And I assume at this point they have repaired the relationship, which is great because I know that he's been in talks to get back into fighting in glory once again. He has been gone far, far too long and the fans really want to see him back. He probably he gave Rico Verhoeven one of the toughest fights of his entire career he was one or two punches away from being the new champion and uncrowning Rico so some some of the insider information that I have is that I know that he was in talks to be in the Grand Prix so in talks I don't know exactly what happened if he wasn't physically ready or there wasn't some agreement Glory did come out and make a statement about Jamal Ben Sadiq and said for his comeback this is just a little bit too early. So I don't know if he had a small injury or they just can come to an agreement, but I, it sounds like things are trending in a positive direction that Jamal Ben Sadiq will be in glory in 2024, which I know fans and myself are very excited for. So that's going to be great. Look out for that. Ideally, later down the line, when both men are recovered and fully healthy, I would love to see a full camp Jamal Ben Sadiq and an uninjured Antonio Plazabot face off against one another. That would be incredible. Will Jamal Ben Sadiq be in this tournament on March 9th? Look, today is early February. We are less than a month away, unless he's been in training camp for the last four weeks. You probably don't want him in this tournament because you want him to compete in a one night tournament against three people in tip top shape. And he hasn't fought since 2021. I don't know what his training regiment has looked like, but if he is taking this, it's incredibly short notice. He might be coming in where he's not at his best. And maybe you, you as a fan don't want that. But again, if he comes out and says, no, I've been in training camp. I am in perfect shape. I'm ready for March 9th. He would be awesome to have in this tournament. I think that'd be amazing. Jamal Ben Sadiq, I'll give you a pretty low odds. I'm not saying it's impossible. It might happen. I think it's most likely to be Benjamin Adek Bowie or Nikola Filipovic. I think it's just likely to be one of those two. I know some people have speculated that it might be, you know, Lucy, the K1 and WLF champion. I, I wouldn't count on that. Again, it's pretty short notice to bring in a champion from overseas. Some people have speculated Kenta Nanbara. I, I just wouldn't expect that. A champion from Rise coming over on such short notice. I, I would think it's Benjamin Attic Bowie or Nikola Filipovic. Benny was already scheduled to be one of the replacements for March 9th, so I know that he's been in training camp and getting ready for the March 9th date. 
but it could be Jamal Ben Sadiq. I'm not saying that's impossible. It just, it could be Jamal Ben Sadiq. I'm just saying the odds are lower of that. Would I like it to be Jamal Ben Sadiq? Yes, that'd be awesome. Would I like it to be Lucy? Yes, that would be amazing. Do I expect it? No, I'm expecting Benjamin Adekbui. Oh my God. I'm just, people ask for a longer episode. I'm just powering through these subjects now. I'm just, sorry. It's just been, it's just been a busy day, you know? Got the website going and stuff. I'll talk about that at the end of the kind of roadmap for what we're doing here. Okay, but this weekend coming up on Friday, you have one fight night and 19. Jonathan Haggerty will be defending his Muay Thai crown against Felipe Lobo. I love it. This is a great fight. A champion in Muay Thai is defending his title against a top ranked contender. He's not jumping sports. He's not having a super fight. He's not mixing, you know, he's not having mixed rules, bouts or whatever. He's defending his championship against a deserving contender. Love to see it awesome fight. And I think it's a better fight than what people are giving it credit for as well. Felipe Lobo is underrated going in. He is a highly, highly skilled and dangerous fighter who's extremely aggressive. He fronts, he fights really well on the front foot, throwing one twos, front kicks. He loves elbows on the inside. He's a really highly skilled and dangerous fighter. I think people are really underestimating this, the game that Felipe Lobo is bringing in. He's just coming off the win against Samapet in which he was knocked down in the first round and then rallied back to score a knockout victory in the third round. And in between that time, even though he was knocked down, he didn't seem dazed. It seems like he recovered instantly, got back to his feet, finished the round strong, uh, you know, did well in the second round as well, and then knocked him out in the third round. And that's absolutely awesome, awesome to see. Jonathan Eggerty, of course, he's coming off the knockout wins in his last few bouts, defended, picking up a kickboxing title, picking up a Muay Thai title against Nongo, really impressive stuff, and, and won those victories in impressive style, in knockouts, and looked dominant from bell to bell in all of those bouts. So Jonathan Haggerty, I think, is just in his prime. He's just entering his prime at this moment. He's dangerous on the feet. Once he spots an opening, he aims for a knockout. He's dangerous with his front kicks. Like everyone from like Psalm A and all uh, Rod Tang have talked about how skilled he is with the front kicks. And if you're getting compliments from people like that, that's a huge thing. That's a huge feather in your cap from for people who are so experienced in Muay Thai to say this guy is amazing at this one technique really does say a lot. He also packs a ton of power now that he's not cutting as much weight as he used to. Really what he likes to do is is control the distance in the fight using his kicks. When people come in close, he lands elbows, punches, that sort of stuff. But he does aim for the knockout, and I love to see that. So while I do think Felipe Lobo is underrated coming in and people aren't giving him the respect he deserves, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to jump. I'm going to flip flop here and say he's probably going to lose this fight. Thing is with Felipe Lobo from watching tape study on him, I think he's a lot more comfortable in the big gloves because he likes to do the high double forearm block as his, his protection. And the reason he does that is because he wants to respond, stay on the inside, and counter with elbows. But if he backs away, then he's not on the inside, you know? So instead he stays low, covers his head with his gloves, and then tries to land elbows in return. But with smaller gloves, the double forearm block is not really great protection. So both Nongo knocked him out with an uppercut while he was in the double forearm guard. His last fight against Samapetch, Samapetch scored a knockdown with an uppercut because Lobo was in that double forearm block. Now, again, we were talking about layers of defense. You want to move your feet, you want to parry, you want to move your head, and then the last line of defense is blocking with your gloves. And then countering again is mixed into each one of those layers. But he goes right to blocking, trying to counter from there. So he stays inside on the pocket, which is where he wants to be. But because of it, we've seen him get caught with a lot of uppercuts and things like that. The double forearm block, even with big gloves, is not the best blocking system. You do want to do everything else before going right to blocking. But with small gloves, blocking with the double forearm is not great. So I am expecting Jonathan Hegarty to walk away defending his title in this one against a top contender, but it's a good fight. I'm going to be watching that one live. That's a really fun one. Tons of good fights on the one Fight Night 19 card. We also have Sam Apech going to be fighting Mohamed Yuniz Raba. Daniel Williams and Lito Adwang in MMA, both friends of the show. That's just going to be a banger. That is a really, really exciting fight. You have Liam Nolan taking on Najat Trujillo. Luke Lesse taking on Eddie Abasolo in featherweight MMA. This might be the top two American Muay Thai strikers alive right now facing off in Muay Thai. And I had a really cool interview with Luke Lesse where he was talking about like he's smooth Eddie Abasolo. I want to be more smooth than him. I want to fold him up, crumple him and make his kids cry. And then we talked about like 
retro soul music and stuff like that. And coming from the Midwest and not being a wrestler and how boring things are in the Midwest. So Luke Lesse is a cool guy. Eddie Abasolo, I've talked about in the past of just how chill it's like fighting is such a weird thing of you go to war against these people and they're your best friend. It's like you have so much respect for people after you fight them. Eddie Abasolo is a super cool, super chill guy trained with Denzel Curry, of course, which is just super cool to see. So I'm excited for the Luke Lisi versus Eddie Abasolo fight. Thong Poon is on it. He's against Timur Chukiev. Yeah, good. It's a really good fight card. Uh, up and down. Got some really good Muay Thai fights in there. I really, for MMA, I like that Daniel Williams versus Lito Adewang fight. That's really good right there. This weekend as well, we also have the Australia versus the World Alpha Fight Series that you can watch on Fight TV. It's going to have Typhoon Ozcan versus Matthew Stevens. Uh, you have Collins versus El Hamuti. You have Harut Gregorian versus Honey. So there's going to be a lot of really good fights on the card. Most notably, it is Chad Collins. There's Typhoon Ozcan. So there's a lot of really big names on the card. And yeah, it's a, it's a good fight event. So check that out if you'd like. Also, it sounds like the Buakau versus Manny Pacquiao boxing match in Bangkok was canceled for later this year. I think it was booked for mid-April or something like that. It's been in talks since late 2023. Uh, but yeah, it sounds like it has been canceled because Petch Morikot was supposed to be fighting on that card and Chad Collins was supposed to be fighting on that card. Both have come out and said that the promoter says that this is canceled. The promoter has come out and said that the fight has been just delayed, but indefinitely delayed at this point. They have put up $25 million for it. So, you know, it's with this much money on the line, with how, uh, you know, it looks like it's been canceled, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we just never see that fight. Plus, I'm, I don't know, like none of us are interested in that fight in all honesty. It's just two cool names going up against each other from, from very different sports. Like, Buakau has never been a big puncher, but he would have a size advantage on Manny Pacquiao. But even then... Uh, like in a pure boxing rules bout, exhibition boxing, I just can't imagine Buakau having much success against Manny Pacquiao in boxing. It, both are under contract with Ryzen. Whether or not that happens there, I don't know. Maybe. I think Manny Pacquiao is just uh, teasing because he does a speech every year in Ryzen saying, I'm going to fight in Ryzen this year. and never does. I think he's, there's just some money that he gets paid for doing this stuff. Uh, but Buakau actually shows up and fights. He's taken tons of exhibition. I think he had five exhibition, not exhibition, sorry. He had five bouts in 2023 alone. Some in BKFC Muay Thai, some in kickboxing, some in, uh, I think there was one exhibition mixed in in there. Uh, I think he fought in Ryzen last year as well. So he's keeping busy. He needs that income. Manny Pacquiao has been a little bit more mixed. He's taken one or two exhibition bouts in the last couple of years. Uh, but it's, you know, still in good shape. But yeah. Yeah. So that's indefinitely canceled. If, if that changes that, sorry, that is in, that is indefinitely canceled. And if that changes, that's great. That's fine. And if we do see it, that's great. That's fine. I'll happily cover it. But as, as far as we know now, it seems to be canceled. One fight night, 20 fights have been announced. Janet Todd will face off against Fed Jija with the Atomweight kickboxing title on the line. Fed Jija captured the interim title earlier this year against Anissa Mexen, and now she'll shake on and now she'll take on the champion, Janet Todd. So Janet Todd, she was the kickboxing champion who won it, I think in 2020 or 2019, I can't remember. But she won an interim title in Muay Thai, but couldn't quite get the undisputed title. Uh, but yeah, Fed Jija versus Janet Todd, really excited for that one. You also have the Muay Thai atomweight title on the line as well with Alicia Helen Rodriguez taking on Morales. That's really good. So a Muay Thai champion taking on a top contender, great to see. And a kickboxing champion taking on a top contender in the main event, awesome to see. Big fan of Fet Gija, big fan of Alicia Helen Rodriguez. This should be a ton of fun. So let's talk a little bit about the future of calf kickboards and what we're going to be doing here. So I, I don't know that people, in conversations that I've had privately, I, I don't think people realize kind of what, what my role in, 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 in this sphere is. So back a few years ago, 2021, 2020, something like that, I was having trouble finding work. But at the time, so I had just moved, I quit my job in Canada and moved to the UK and that was mid COVID. So nowhere was really hiring, but it's also very hard to find a job as a migrant. I had a work visa for it here, but nowhere wanted to hire me. I had talked to banks, which I was in financial planning before and banks were like, no, you're not qualified to do UK financial planning. It's different than Canada's financial planning. Fine, whatever. Talked to grocery stores and they're like, no, you don't know how to stock shelves because you don't experience stocking shelves. And I was like, oh my God, just someone has to start paying me money here. Um, and then I realized at one point that I was staying up or waking up early, setting my alarm, watching fights from Japan, watching fights from Singapore, watching fights from Poland, watching fights from the UK and staying up and watching fights in the US. And I thought, someone should actually just pay me for this because I would go on Reddit to talk about all these things and realize that 
while a lot of people were watching those fights individually, no one was watching all those fights. So I thought I should start getting paid for it. And now here we are today. But I talked to a website a while back and said, like, big fan, blah, blah, blah. Can I write for you? The website said no, because you have no experience as a writer. So what I did is I bought my own dot com and that was calfkicksports.com. And then I wrote for this website and then I reapplied at these websites and said, I've been writing for calfkicksports.com as their managing editor. I'm like, I hired, I hired myself. Like I was, <laughs> I was the only person there, but I said, like, I've been managing this website and as I ended up was a writer for this website and people said, oh, great, you have writing experience. Come on in. <laughs> and that was my foot in the door in the industry. And I, for a long time, I wasn't getting paid very much, but we knew there was a ton of potential and over time it grew. So we found different things that were working. We found things that weren't working over time, but eventually I did change my name on social media. So I actually used to just be calf Cake sports and that was my Instagram and that got changed to, to Tim Wheaton. And then we started and then I spoke to Ash and he had a meme page on Instagram and he was like, hey, should we do like interviews and then book fighters and just see what we can do with YouTube? And I was like, yeah, of course. At the time, I was only a writer for one website and I wasn't really doing interviews. So Ash was this really big push to say, like, I think we can do this together. And he also wasn't someone I knew. Like we talked on the phone once. And then we both knew, like, yeah, we're doing this. <laughs> let's start a podcast. Let's start interviewing fighters. So from there, uh, we couldn't agree on a name, but we both like Calf Kick Sports. So we we actually restarted the, a Calf Kick Sports account, a Twitter, um, uh, like a Twitter, an Instagram, a YouTube, a, a TikTok as well, like all the stuff that we could think of. And then we started interviewing fighters. And honestly, I think just the success from interviewing fighters is there's no secret. It just ask for it. Go to the biggest organization you can think of and then ask for an interview. And if it's not the UFC, they will give you the interview because they want people to work with them. They want to give you those fighters in interviews. They want the exposure. And again, the, the UFC has different rules, but every other organization just honestly just con contact us on their website or find an email address or contact them on social media and they'll probably give it to you. Contacting fighters directly through Instagram works about 50% of the time. I'm not going to guarantee it always works. So anyway, so we built up Calf Kick Sports on social media while also building up our personal brand. And uh, so I became a writer for other websites like MMA Sucka, Beyond Kickboxing, Combat Press. I wrote for a ton of other websites in between there, like ArabsMMA.com. I wrote for, like, I, I still write for MuayThai.com. There's so many that I'm forgetting as well. <laughs> Oh, Sports Kita, of course. I don't, I don't know how I forgot that I did a ton of work with Sports Kita as well. Um, I, I wrote press releases for MMA companies. You know, like when you speak to someone who's higher up in a company, my six, my advice for success is, first of all, go listen to James Lynch's videos. Those were the ones that I followed as a template for my success in this industry. He gives really good advice for people starting out in the, in the industry. But also, if you can offer multiple services to a company, ask them. They're going to say no to 99% of the things that you offer to them. But what if they say yes to the 1%? So you approach them and say, I can do interviews. And they say, awesome. And then you can say, hey, I do press releases. Sometimes they say yes. And you get paid for that. Anyway, anyway, I'm getting, this is beside the point. Um, but yeah, Calf Kick Sports has continued to grow at a very, very impressive rate. And I'm actually quite proud to work in the company of Calf Kick Sports and the people that we work with. We are now adding, so we, we always had podcasts before, like Kick Weekly and the Calf Kick Sports podcast. We've always done interviews with fighters from the UFC and One Championship and Glory and so many other organizations like the PFL. And those are incredible, top of the line, high quality interviews. And I'm proud of them as well. And now we're just adding video essays to the channel in addition to that. So things continue to grow. We now have a video editor who is going to be helping us out with interviews because we were all, we were just so busy. We still have so many interviews in the pipe. I actually think right now we have 10 interviews just sitting around, not being uploaded because of how busy we are all the time. So we added in a video editor to help us like slap on some editing and let's go. <laughs> and that's been an awesome help. That's, I'm so grateful for all that help. That's really good. And Calf Kick Sports is just three people who are incredibly passionate about combat sports and want to cover more. And we're very proud of what we do. And because of that, we have grown this YouTube channel and Instagram to compete with established websites. Like you can go compare our YouTube view numbers to any other website that covers the same sport and we'll probably beat them. If you pick an interview on someone else's channel, compare it to the numbers of on our channel and maybe we'll beat them.
Our podcasts do very good numbers, uh, whether it's kickboxing or MMA. Our Instagram, personally, and the Kafka Sports one do very good numbers. So we, so what a lot of companies are doing is they have a website and then they have social media around that. And we're going to do the opposite. So we built social media. And now we're going to build a website around it. So KafkaSports.com is now in my possession again. And now uh, let's let's build it up. And um, yeah, we're going to see what we can do with it. I think building a little bit of news in the combat sports world. I see very high quality breakdowns. I've always been inspired by things like Fightland, and I would like to do high quality work like that. And, and of course, we're going to have our podcasts on there as well. But yeah, CalfKickSports.com is is the next step in what we're doing here. And I think down the line, we're also going to be doing a Patreon. So and I'm not going to promise a bunch of exclusive content or anything like that. This is down the line again, it's down the line, but I'm not going to promise a bunch of exclusive content on Patreon. If you subscribe, you'll get exclusive interviews and stuff like that. No, honestly, if you want to support the network, whatever, yes, we'll set that up in the future, but I'm not going to over promise and not deliver to people. Folks, if you have any ideas for content on what Kafka Sports should do, uh, let us know. Uh, or, uh, you know, if you want to do any work for us, whether it's on the interview side or writing side on the website or whatever you want to do, uh, like, let us know. Like, I'll be up front. We're not paying or anything like that at this time, hopefully in the future. Uh, but yeah, if you want to be part of this builder and build up something for the future that you're proud of, let me know. So, folks, that's Kick Weekly with Tim Wheaton. Massively appreciate your time. Folks, this has been a ton of fun. So uh, and next week, I am away. I don't think there will be a kick weekly next week. I am in Saudi Arabia with the PFL. Should be doing a travel blog for that one, but I'll have a, some videos like media scrums and interviews coming out for that because I'll be there all week. <clears throat> but yes, folks, this has been Kick Weekly with Tim Wheaton. Massively appreciate your time. Thank you so much for joining in the world of kickboxing and Muay Thai. I appreciate you. Thank you so much, folks, and we'll talk to you soon.